Hey guys and welcome back to Neat Cooking. The first thing you want to, the first thing you're gonna want to do is toast the bagel. Take the bagel over here, put it next to the sausages that you cooked yesterday and have in the fridge. Place one slice of American cheese onto the bagel. Step four is to place these sausages somehow on top of the cheese uh, so that they don't roll off. This is the hardest step. Step five is to give up on trying to place the sausages all in on the fucking thing and just give up on that and then squirt some fucking ketchup all over it. Step six is to close the bun. Final step is to make up for the lack of nutritional value with a fiber supplement and a multivitamin. Itadakimasu. All right, so I finished the prologue for Magikoi and I have to say, I'm really enjoying it so far. And uh, this just goes to show that my attitudes are wrong. So I always knew I would like Magikoi as soon as I started reading about it. Other people talking about it. Like, as soon as I started reading reviews and doing more research into visual novels, everything that I heard about Magikoi sounded good. But none of that stuff is the things I normally do for most visual novels. Because for most visual novels, they're not that as well, well, you know, I spend a lot of time on VNDB. I really love VNDB. I spend almost as much time just going through VNDB as I do actually playing visual novels. So, um, you know, I, I do a lot of like adding stuff to my wish lists and whatever. Uh, and here's the thing about Magikoi. Even though I added it to my wish list before I'd even, you know, just upon finding out about it, I would, if, if it hadn't been for the fact that I'd done my own extra research, because Magikoi is relatively well known, and so it just comes up when you when you know it just comes up regularly with regards to visual novels, um, particularly like slice of life visual novels is one of the better known and better respected ones. Um, it doesn't have any of the things that I normally look for in a visual novel. So okay, when I'm looking for a visual novel to play, obviously I will look at the rating that it has on VNDB, and people on VNDB tend to have pretty decent taste. Uh, so far, at least, that I've seen. Uh, but the other thing I do first is, like, scroll down to the bottom of the page and look at the character designs and the art style, because I, I don't know, I, I don't want to look at something that's ugly for, like, uh, 50 hours or whatever. And the thing about Magikoi that struck me is that I don't really like the character designs that much. Like... The character designs didn't stand out to me, and they weren't, like, you know, they're fine, they're possible, but when I looked at them devoid of context, I thought, like, eh, you know, eh, like, they're kind of average, they're not amazing, they're not terrible, they're not, like, unwatchable, un unseeable, unwatchable, they're not awful, they're not ugly, but they're not, like, super appealing the same way some other character designs are. Um, you know, like in Super Hebe, the character design, as soon as you see the Super Hebe character designs, you like, oh, like, that's something powerful. Or as soon as you see, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But, um, the character designs didn't really grab me, the art style didn't really grab me. And then normally I'll look up at the tags, and the tags was what was interesting to me. But then I'll read the synopsis, and the synopsis also gave me a premise which was like, it's about samurai girls in a samurai school? Like, what is this? Like, is this for, like, historic history nerds? Like, Japanese history nerds? Like, or is this for, like, people who are really into samurai culture? Like, what is this? I don't know about this. Like, samurai girls? Am I interested in that? Like, that seems, like, weird. I don't know if I'm... I, like, that doesn't sound like Moe slice of life stuff. That sounds like... Samurai, like, is this, is this going to be, like, an action? Like, what's going on here? And it wasn't very appealing to me. Which just goes to show, you should never judge things by their premise, because the premise could be completely fucking nonsense, and as long as it's executed well, you know. Firstly, you can't sum up a fucking 50-hour visual novel in a paragraph of premise. Like, no one can do that properly. But... Like, things just make sense when they're in the context of a story. The only way to really know is to play it, which sucks. But the only way to really know is to play it. Now, the tags are much more helpful here for deciding which visual novels to play because they will actually tell you about the content of it, not just, you know, surface-level stuff. Although they are, to be honest, somewhat surface-level. 
they're not a substitute for actually playing it, but just to see what is worth playing and not. Um, but yeah, Magikoi, like, the character designs, when I first saw them, I thought, like, you know, eh, I don't really like these, like, they're not particularly grabbing me, none of these are standing out as particularly cute or interesting or endearing or anything, but once you start playing the game and you get to know the characters, like, each of their character designs fits them perfectly. Like, the way they look, I can't imagine them looking any other way. The art style, like, I can't imagine the art style working, like, in in, in, a, in a different style. Like, even though devoid of context, when I just saw them, I think this is the third time I've said devoid of context, but, um, you know, without, without knowing about their character personalities, uh, or getting to know the characters, like, I didn't understand, but now that I have gotten to know the characters, I won't say I love, they're not my favourite character designs ever, but they work well for what they are. Like, they, they, each one suits the person they fit, if, you, if that makes sense, pretty well. Like, some of them better than others, but generally pretty well. Then I think one of the things that threw me off is that this Magikoi as a whole is kind of like a, it, it tries to subvert, to, to uh, subvert tropes a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. And so I think part of it is that, like, the character designs themselves aren't very tropey. Um, they are a bit, but they're not, like, super tropey. Uh, for example, the girl with twin tails isn't a tsundere. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, th what I'm saying is that from hearing the synopsis of, like, oh, a group of girls that are samurai, samurai girls who are... Like I, I, like, I would have been like, what the fuck, if I hadn't already done other research and known that this is one of the most well-respected Slice of Life vision novels, then I would have probably just written it off as, so like, eh, maybe I'll just play that at some point in the future, but I'm not very interested in it now. But in reality, like, even though that is a big plot point, and, I mean, that's the whole setting of the fucking story, like, really, it's got nothing to do with samurai culture or anything like there's fights and stuff there are, there are fights and the school is a like it's all a big what i'm saying is it's good it's it's better than that premise would have you let off which makes me want to look back at that visual novel that i wrote off because it's about girls that can fly it's about people who can fly you know that one it, it the synopsis is like in a world where flying is as easy as riding a bicycle or something like that and as soon as i read that i was like what the fuck like come on but maybe it's actually amazing, and I'm just writing it off for fucking stupid reasons, because I think flying is bad. And then you have other situations, like my Tetsu, which is like a, a fucking synopsis that is written directly for me. It's like, here's a bunch of cute girls and trains, and I'm like, oh my god, just, 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 you know, get it inside of my brain. And then the actual fucking thing was, like, really overblown melodrama and just like not that i mean t on a technical level my tetsu was amazing and that's what makes me so mad that i didn't like it because the stories were just both overly overly melodramatic and boring at the same time um like very cheesy very corny over the top type of stuff and what's weird is that like they even put effort into building character like the characters their personalities are well set up, their relationships are well set up, their motivations are well set up, but they don't use any of it to craft an interesting story. They just fall back on the same melodramatic tropes that a million anime and manga and other otaku stuff have used a million times. I mean, they're not the exact same, but very, like... Like, it's almost like the stakes are too high. Like, I would have rather if my Tetsu told a much more personal story rather than a story of, like, we have to save this entire town, and, like, oh, this is the arc right now, is that these children are going to die. These children are going to die in a storm if you don't drive this train to the right place to pick them up. Like, I don't want to see that. I want to see a bunch of fucking cute girls having fun fucking around with trains. And that's when the visual novel's at its best, but it's, it's honestly, th that makes up a disappointingly small segment of it, which is a shame. Anyway, sorry, just ranting about my Tetsu because I'm still m mad about the fact that it wasn't what I wanted it to be. Uh, but Magikoi is great. 
Uh, I can recommend it 100%. If you want a visual novel to read, but you don't want to read something like super serious, like normally when people are getting into visual novels, they're recommended like, oh, read Higurashi and read fucking, uh, uh, what the, uh, the Sino Uta and like all these really serious ones. If you want to get into a visual novel or like ones that are just like about sex, like Nekopara, if you want to read a visual novel that's like, even if you're new to, to visual novels, if you want to read one that's like, uh, you know, slice of lifey, but not like just about sex, then I can recommend Magikoi to you. you by far the worst thing. Probably the, the, by far the, no, no, it's by far the worst thing, which makes my life way worse, but it's the only real thing that's like, makes my life worse about not using the YouTube website. And that is, the effort of subscribing to a new channel. So this obviously is not going to affect my fucking RSS feed, pressing the subscribe button. Now, if you're lucky, it's an older channel and older channels have a URL that has their channel ID in it, but newer created channels don't have their channel ID in the URL. So look, as you can see, this one is just, the URL is C slash everyday simple flips, right? And the, as far as I know, the only way to get the channel ID is to go to view page source and then to fucking search for, uh, I think it's like URL or something. Channel URL. No. Uh, you can generally find it because it's on this really long line. Yeah, there we go. The really long line with all the list of countries. So it's somewhere over here. Uh, somewhere. Aha, here we, I think, is this it? No. Maybe. The one with the list of countries, is it at the end of the list of countries? I don't, I think this is not it. Because I think it should be like over here somewhere. All right, let's let's try doing some more searches. I think it's called channel URL. Channel URL. I think that's what it's called. But this is going to take ages to fucking search because YouTube is obviously a very big page. Okay, so it's not over here anywhere. Um. Oh, oh, we found it. See, that's how long the search took. Okay, now we have it. It's this. So now we have to copy that. And now we have to go into a fucking terminal. Vim.newsboat slash URLs. And now we have to paste it here. And now we have to copy this. Paste it here. Okay, now I think it's done, except that I for some reason have a U. Oh, the U is supposed to. Okay. And now it's done. Now I have just subscribed to a channel. That's how difficult it is to subscribe to a fucking channel. What is the actual content section of this video going to be? All of my videos have the same structure where they're a bunch of filler and then an actual content section. The actual content section of this video is about meeting YouTubers in real life. Um, apparently that's something I thought of that would be mildly interesting to talk about. And it probably won't last very long because I didn't meet many YouTubers in real life, but I met a few and we're going to talk about the stories and I'm probably going to forget, I, I, like I've, I've written them down, I have notes over here with just lists of names, but I, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I don't remember what because I forgot it. That's how forgetting works. When you forget something, you don't remember the thing that you forgot. That's how it works. I'm not sure if you're not sure if you were aware of that, but um, they, there's your little bit of um, infotainment for today. Right. Uh, so let's start off with uh, the the obvious ones that I met at a convention. Uh, this was at this convention I met uh, Tomskar, Bing. I don't know if Bing even still makes videos or if people even know who Bing is, but back in the day he used to. Um, make videos with Tomscar, and then they had a big falling out. It's a fucking whole situation, you can look into it yourself, but Bing was there as well, and the Yogscast were there, but not fucking Lewis and Simon, just 
other random members of the Yogs cast. Uh, or maybe Lewis and Simon were there, but just not when I went. Like, I don't know. They weren't there when I saw it, when I saw their booth. So maybe I just missed them. I don't know. But uh, Tom's, at the time, I was big into magic and card tricks. So um, when I... Bing is not a very pop, not that popular. So his boot, he was just standing there, and no one was going up to him. I felt kind of bad for him. I went up to him, and I was like, "Hey, what up?" And he was like, "Hey," and I was very awkward because I was like, very awkward, and I was like, "Can I show you a magic trick?" And I did a little magic trick, and he was like, "Ha ha! Oh, I guess that's kind of neat." Very polite, and uh, I said, "Can you sign a card for me?" And he signed it. Um, and then I did the same thing for Tom Scar. Um, his line was a lot longer, but when I got to the front, I tried to do the card trick as quickly as I possibly could. Um, uh, and, uh, after I did it, he, he said, you bastard to me and laughed. And I, I remember that I was like, haha, I epic, epically owned Tom Scar with a card trick. I did that twice, by the way, because I went to that convention twice. The first time I did that, and the second time... The only person who was there that I was interested in or knew about was Tom Scar, and so I did it again, and he didn't remember me. I didn't ask, well, maybe he did, but I didn't ask him. But I did the same, I did a magic trick to him again the next year when I went to the same convention. Um, I don't really remember what happened. Maybe that didn't, maybe that didn't happen. I might be just making that up in my mind. I feel like that happened. I feel like I remember that happening, but maybe I don't remember that happening. I'm not sure if that's true. I think I met him twice at, at the same convention two years in a row, but I don't remember. I remember doing a magic trick to him once. Maybe the second time I didn't do a magic trick. Who knows? But either way, I met him at this convention, did a trick to him. He called me a bastard. I thought I was funny. Then I went over to the Yogscast booth, and Lewis and Simon weren't there, so I was just like, uh, that guy, that's... Sjin, I think was his name, his Yogscast gamer tag, epic gamer tag, Sjin. I didn't really watch his videos, but he was the only one there that I, like, mildly cared about. So, I went up to Sjin, I took a selfie with him on, like, a really old phone that I don't have anymore. So that's the, the story behind that one. <laughs> Those three at that convention. Um, so next up... Uh, that's the convention category these are broken down into categories so the next one is um, somewhat linked to the magic side of that story which is there's this guy I suppose I count him as a YouTuber I don't know if he even still makes YouTube videos but he has like last time I checked he had quite a few subscribers let me, let me check One second. Yeah, he has 188k, so he, he's pretty... And he's... Uh, no, he's not still making videos. He hasn't made a video for two years, so... Um, <laughs> but I, I'm going to count him as a YouTuber because he has almost 200k subscribers, so that counts you as a YouTuber, in my opinion. Um, but this guy, Stephen Bridges, he's a magician. That's how I know him. He's a magician. And um, this is going to lead into... Oh, I fucked up. I was trying to make the camera better, and I've just made it infinitely worse. Is this is this good? I feel like now I'm, now the angle's too high. This is just weird. anyway, whatever. So Stephen Bridges, magician. Um, I've met him on multiple different occasions. So I've met him twice when he was doing street magic, um, because he performs in Leicester Square regularly. Well, actually, I think he's in Common Garden now. I don't know where he is these days, but he for a while was doing like street performances um, and I ran into him a couple times and I was like, hey, you're Stephen Bridges. But those two times that I ran into him, I already knew him before, well, I knew who he was and I'd met him beforehand at, and this is, this is where it gets to, like, these don't really count as YouTubers, but, um, so in the, like, the cardistry community, there's, like, a bunch of people that I met who, like, technically, they're not YouTubers, but they, like, they post stuff on YouTube regularly, or they did back then. Cardistry's kind of on Instagram now. I don't follow it anymore, but, but uh, Zach Mueller being the main one. So, uh, and he's uh, fairly. His some of his videos have a lot of views. So maybe Zach Mueller counts as a YouTuber. I don't know, but uh, he Zach Mueller did like a tour around the world where he'd he'd, he'd go around the world. He did it twice actually, 
Um, he'd go around the world and just do like cardistry jams at different cities. Um, and when he came to London, I went there and Stephen Bridges was also there, along with like a bunch of pretty well-known English magicians and cardist people. Like Ollie Mealing was there and stuff like that. Not that anyone who's watching this knows who the fuck Ollie Mealing is. Um, but that happened. The second time he did it, he brought along with him a guy called Bizarro Christian, who is uh, also pretty well known in the cardistry and magic community. Uh, so I met him, and then that was a whole story because then later in the same year, Bizarro or Biz messaged me on Facebook and was like, do you want to come to my birthday party at Nando's? And I was like, okay. And so I went to that. It was like him, a bunch of, he's like, he, he at the time was like my age, like how old I am now. So it was him and a bunch of girls and then like three, like 14 year old kids doing card tricks. It was a very weird situation. I don't know why he thought that was a good idea, but I guess he just messaged people who he knew lived in London. Um, yeah, I wish it happened now because that would have been fun to happen now. Like, if, if that happened now, like, at my age, I would have gone and, like, would have been sick. We would have gone out partying, you know, drinking. Back then, I didn't do shit. I mean, I would, I, I, I would drink, but not at a restaurant, you know. Uh, anyway, that's, like, those are not really YouTubers. But out of all of those, uh, Stephen Bridges is probably the biggest YouTuber. Oh, I also met some other people, like, car street people, like Andrew Avila and stuff like that. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Don't really count as YouTubers. Stephen Bridges is the YouTuber guy. Uh, okay, next. Um, now we're getting to... Okay, well, I'll go... I'll say this one. So, Stora, who are right now the biggest parkour channel on YouTube. Um, see, I very hap I happen, coincidentally, to have a family friend, or, like, a friend of my stepmom, like, someone my stepmom went to school with. Her, her son got into parkour and like happened to live in the same city as a few of the or like the same suburb as a few of the members of Stora and so just being in the parkour scene in that suburb with the Stora people knew knew them and so he and them would like train together and so when I went out to meet him to like hang out with him I, I also met a few of the Stora people before they were, I mean, they were, they were uploading videos. In fact, I was very, very early knowing about Stora. Like, I think I found out because he showed me them at, in, like, 2011. So I was, like, a pretty early subscriber for Stora. It's been crazy watching them grow, because I would always watch their videos, and it's been crazy watching them grow from, like, haha, those parkour lads that my friend, my mate is friends with, and now it's, like, oh, the biggest fucking parkour people on the planet. Pretty wild. Uh, but yeah, I met, um, I f I'm forgetting their names, but I met a few of them. The ginger guy, for example. Uh, I, I'm, I actually filmed some, some of his parkour at one point in a spot in this particular suburb that I'm being very vague about to avoid giving any personal information out. But yeah, so I, I've met a, about, I think, three of the star members back then. This was a long time ago, though. Haven't seen them since. Uh, okay, next is, uh... So you know Tom Scott? I'm assuming you know Tom Scott. He's the, the British guy who wears red shirts like a cartoon character and, and says, you know, you know Tom Scott. You know him. Um, so Tom Scott I haven't met, but his friend... So Tom has a second channel called Matt and Tom, and I've met Matt. I ran into him randomly, and the story is kind of funny. This is a much, much more recent. So those, those other ones happened many years ago. This one's... Uh, like two years ago, three years ago, I don't remember exactly, but um, so <laughs> this was on the second day of a two day, three day long uh, uh sesh, shall we call it, uh, with my good friend Lil Crazy Bitch, um, and uh, I was very fucked up on many substances, <laughs> wandering around central London, and we happened to go past. We have, I don't know, we were just one. it was a derive, if you feel, a bit of psychogeography, you know, a bit of a, a derive, a bit of a, one of those. And so, we, was, we were just wandering around, we ended up near the YouTube space in London, uh, like, 
pretty much one street down, we passed it. And I was like, hey, look, it's the YouTube space. And then we, we walked past it. And then there was this, like, sculpture thing. There was a weird sculpture thing. And Lil Crazy Bitch, being an absolute mad lad, was like, I'm going to climb this sculpture. It was like an abstract sculpture made of, like, poles and stuff. And he was like, I'm going to climb to the top of that. And I was like, you do you, bro. I'll just stay here and hang out because I'm not going to climb that shit. But, hey, if you want to climb it, have fun. So he starts climbing this thing. And then I see a group of lads coming towards us. And then I'm like, hold on a minute. <laughs> That's fucking Matt from Matt and Tom. And I go up to him and I go, I'm like, I know you. And he's like, oh, yeah? And I'm like, you're Matt. And I'm, he's like, yeah. Now, at the time, I had a mohawk. I was wearing an Atari Teenage Riot t-shirt. And, like, I looked like a proper uh, cyberpunk punk man, you know? And uh, I was also very fucked up. So I'm like, I know you. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah. And I was like, I love your videos. And I was, he was like, thank you. And I said, have you just come from the YouTuber space? And I pointed towards it. And he was like, no, nah, we were just in the pub down the road. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a weird coincidence. Running into a YouTuber next to the YouTube space. Who, but just completely coincidentally, the, the two things have nothing to do with each other. And then the conversation very quickly got awkward as he just sort of looked up at my mate who was climbing this fucking thing. And I was like, don't worry about him. <laughs> and he was just like, seemed very confused. And then one of his friends, then one of his friends came up to me and was like, Atari Teenage Fire, are they still making music? And I sort of said like, yeah, well, they, they sort of... Uh, you know, they took a break, but then they t came back to making music. I just saw them live recently, and that's why I got this T-shirt. Um, we had a brief... That was it, basically. Very brief. That was pretty much all we just said. And then he was like, all right. And then they just went. And I was like, that was fucking weird. <laughs> and then we went back to just doing more drugs. So that was a fun time. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably the most, like, running into... A YouTuber that I've experienced, as far as I can remember, unless it's one I'm forgetting. But that was, that was like, yeah, that happened. And then finally, um, and this is the one I'm most embarrassed about. Um, not because of anything I did, but because of... Okay, so I'll just tell you the story. Um, so this is again me and little crazy bitch. Uh, very, very stoned. Walking down the South Bank, if you know where that is in London. We were walking down all the way down the South Bank towards the Tate. If you know London, basically walking down the South Bank of the Thames. It's a, it's a fun scenic route. Um, and this guy comes up to us. Remember, we're extremely stoned. Guy comes up to us and he's like, you want to be in a YouTube video? And I'm like, hell yeah, I want to be in a YouTube video. Now, to, to cut a long story short, basically it was a fake prank video. He was making a fake prank video where the idea was that he would go up to someone, he would go up to us and be like, can I borrow your phone? And then he would be like, oh yeah, can I get the coke tomorrow, please? And then the idea was that we would be like, what is he doing? Whoa, this wacky guy is trying to use my phone to get coke. What's going on? He's doing a drug deal using my borrowed phone. That's such a wacky premise for a prank video. But we were way too stoned to even like think about what the fuck was actually happening in front of us. And so he just like, was told us what to do and then you know the cameraman was like over there somewhere in a very open position like this was very it's was, it was a fake prank video but i didn't really understand what was going on because i was so high and um i because it's so fucking smiling and laughing <laughs> Because <laughs> it was such an absurd situation, and I was so stoned, I just kept smiling, laughing, and looking at the camera. The worst ever. And, um, yeah. We had to keep doing, like, takes, and, like, we have to do, like, ten takes, and I'm sure it didn't end up well at all. Um. I don't know what I was thinking, but I just kept smiling and laughing and, like, looking and not, I couldn't take it fucking seriously. I couldn't actually act or anything. Um. And it was the dumbest shit ever. Anyway, he put us in the fucking video somehow. I don't know how they managed to edit out, edit it down. It never went up on YouTube, actually. But the guy's name is Julius Dean. I didn't know him before, but afterwards, my friend, Lil Crazy Bitch, who was also in the video, 
got recognized in public from the video and they showed him the video on Facebook and you know who Julius Dean was and he was like it's fake and he was really embarrassed about it he he was like re he really regrets doing it and I also really regret doing it because participating in fake prank videos for this scumbag Julius Dean who's like just uh, all around not a good person like even just talking to him then you could tell he's a dickhead but he like he's just a scumbag type of person like you can tell if you watch his videos you know he's a scumbag type of person fake makes fake prank videos on Facebook I mean that's a scumbag type of person already uh, but some he's a youtuber as well like he has a YouTube channel so I'm counting him even though that particular video went up on Facebook it also seems to have been deleted I can't find it anywhere so uh, make of that what you will maybe he's maybe he's embarrassed about it too but uh uh so uh yeah that happened but uh Julius Dean terrible person makes like fake magic videos on Facebook um like fake like the what everyone in the magic community hates people like this like like Rick Lax Rick Lax is such a sad disappointing story because he he used to be a serious ma uh, magician like, this is what's fucked about Rick Lax, is, like, he used to be actually kind of respected in the magic community. Because he, he, like, was a very creative musician, uh, magician. And he was, like, someone who would, like, invent his own tricks. And he was genuinely skilled. And he threw it all away, all, just for the, I guess, fame and money of being a shit Facebook magician that everyone fucking hates. Like, why? What a weird career move. But anyway, he's like he also did those sorts of videos. This Julius Dean fella, and because of that, he got invited on British TV on uh, uh, to do a magic trick, uh, um, and he fucked up the magic trick on live TV. And like everyone in the, the press, like he basically became a laughing stock in the press. Uh, anyway, that's the thing that happened. So that's that's all my stories of YouTubers. I'm kind of glad that I wasted that guy's time by being too stoned to fucking act in his video and making him do like a bunch of takes, but it kind of stopped being fun after the first few times and I was like just confused as to why he was making us do it over and over again, not realizing that I was the one ruining it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think those are the sto all the stories I can remember of times that I've met YouTubers. Uh, so there we go, that's content, right? That's 19 minutes of fucking informative content.